Hey everybody, welcome to the Happy Harvest Homestead. Today I am fulfilling the many requests I have gotten to show how I turn my Angora rabbit fur into yarn and into crochet clothing and projects. My channel is mainly a homesteading channel and I focus on raising animals and growing food and cooking meals and preserving stuff. And I guess in my head I haven't lumped my more crafty pursuits into that category so I've kind of left the crochet and the spinning yarn and the other crafty things I do out of the channel because it's not like homestead stuff but I guess there is some crossover since I keep showing Sylvan my French Angora rabbit so much and when I talk about him in videos I mentioned that I spin his fiber and people are really curious about that which I guess inevitably it would have come up because we now have sheep and they are slowly but surely growing their wool out. So around next spring I'll be able to shear them and then spin their wool. So a demonstration of some kind was bound to pop up eventually. But part of me is surprised I haven't done this sooner because I have been spinning yarn and raising angoras before I started YouTube and I haven't made a single video about it I think ever. <laughs> so here we go. I am fixing the situation and I'm now showing you what I do. I actually first got into rabbits through fiber. I had learned about crochet and fallen in love with that and then I dabbled and still do dabble a little bit in knitting and then I met this really cool lady who would spin her own yarn and of course me being all into sustainability and doing things yourself and not relying on other people was like hey making your own yarn instead of buying from the store would be so cool so she gave me this little tool called a drop spindle and taught me how to spin and while it was very time consuming and not very productive I was just barely a teenager and didn't have the money to buy my own spinning wheel so my mom would buy me sheep's wool and I would spin it on a drop spindle but this lady had a super fluffy French Angora rabbit and she would invite me over and I'd meet him and I'd pet him and I would help brush his fur to get the tangles out and I would harvest some of the wool with her and eventually I was able to convince my parents to let me get my own French Angora rabbit so I could produce my own fiber and spin it myself being even more sustainable a couple years ago I had had a pet rabbit, but nowhere in my mind was raising meat rabbits even a thought in my head. But one French Angora rabbit for fiber turned into a breeding pair who didn't end up having any babies because I had no idea what I was doing and I did several things wrong. And then my siblings were like, hey, she gets pets, why can't we have pets? So they got some meat rabbits. And then I fell in love with those rabbits and all the babies they had because their rabbits actually worked properly and had babies, whereas my doe was having issues getting pregnant. So eventually, when they got tired of their rabbits, I took over and expanded the meat rabbit operation, building my first colony, and I've talked about all that before. But in addition to the meat rabbit venture, I would have Angora rabbits on and off. Sometimes I just had adults for fiber, or other times I'd get breeding pairs to have babies and make some money, which kind of worked and also kind of was a huge pain and failed miserably sometimes as well. And eventually I decided that Angora rabbits are a lot of work and you don't really get that much fur from them and you have to keep their super long fur clean and free of tangles, which means they have to live in cages and be fed pellets which you know is not in line with my views on being a good steward over the animals God entrusts to your care. So we contemplated getting sheep and then eventually got sheep and this had all coincided kind of with a bunch of my angoras getting sick with the rest of the rabbits who got pastorella a couple years ago. So I was down to just a couple angora rabbits and so I slowly pared everybody down and I was just going to get out of them all together, but I couldn't find a really good home for Sylvan because he is such a sweet boy and I've just fallen in love with him. I couldn't just give him up to anybody and no really good candidates popped up. So he is now our backup breeding buck for the meat rabbits because he's an excellent breeder. He's an excellent father. He's an excellent colony buck. In addition to producing wonderful wool and having an amazing personality, Obviously, being a completely different breed than a meat rabbit, he has been bred for good wool genetics and not meat genetics, but if something happens to Henry, having Sylvan to replace him real quick will be much easier than going months with no breeding buck as I search for a new one. 
but Sylvan's main purpose on this farm is still fiber production. Beginning every fall and going through spring, when the weather is cool enough that he can keep all his long hot fur on, I will let his fur grow out, making sure it stays clean and brushed and free of tangles, and then it'll get to a certain point where it begins to shed off or fall out, kind of like, you know, a dog's coat would. So I will brush it out and save it in my fiber stash for when I have the time and energy to spend a large portion of my times for a few days or a week just spinning and spinning and spinning and making tons of yarn. I apologize for interrupting this enthralling video, but I want to take this opportunity to announce that my handmade crochet dish scrubbies are now on sale. I have been perfecting this pattern for years, and me, my family, our friends and neighbors all rave about these scrubbies. They are the perfect size to fit in your hand, and they are very bendable, so you can easily clean the nooks and crannies of your dishes and cutlery. Because they are made with 100% cotton yarn, they are very durable and will last for years, and it is super easy to clean and reuse them. Each pack includes seven scrubbies, so you can use one each day. Then at the end of the week, take all your dirty scrubbies, put them in a mesh bag, then stick them in your washer and then in your dryer as usual. Then they are all fresh and clean and ready to be used for the next week. The link to my Etsy store is in the description box below this video if you want to check them out. Alright, now back to the video. A couple years ago I finally saved up enough money to buy myself a tiny little spinning wheel and while I have dabbled in this realm of making yarn, I feel like I'm still in the beginner slash intermediate level. I'm by no means an expert, so I don't really know all the technical terms for things or whatever, but I know enough to get by and for now that's enough for me. I usually do my spinning in batches because once you get everything set up and you have all the fiber and all the yarn strung and tied around different places, it's hard to assemble everything and then disassemble it over and over again. So if I just dedicate a large portion of time all at once to it, it makes things a lot easier. Basically, how you make yarn is you simply twist a bunch of animal hair fibers together really, really tight until it makes a string, and a drop spindle or a spinning wheel is a super easy and efficient way to do that. I will pedal with my feet, which turns a wheel, which turns a giant rubber band, which turns another wheel, which turns some pegs around the bobbin, and the bobbin will fill up with one ply of yarn. Then once I fill up two bobbins, I will string the plies together, twisting them around each other even more to make the yarn thicker and stronger. You can make two ply yarn, three, four, people get all fancy and technical with it, but two ply yarn is pretty easy and that's what I usually stick with. Once the two ply yarn bobbin is filled up, I will cut the yarn and take it off the bobbin, rolling it into a ball, and then start the process over until I either run out of time, or get bored, or run out of fiber to spin with. Then I have a whole bunch of homemade 100% Angora wool yarn that I can do whatever I want with. Angora yarn is super warm. I believe it's like 10 times warmer than sheep's wool, and it doesn't have a lot of shape to it or a lot of like spring or stretch. Like if you make a slipper with it, the slipper won't hold its shape very well. Certain projects are better than others, but really I can make whatever I want with it. This sweater is super special to me because it is made entirely of Lucky's fiber. It's the last fiber I harvested from him before he got sick and I had to cull him. He wasn't quite as good as Sylvan. For some reason he couldn't get a doe pregnant, but he was a super sweet buck with an amazing personality. He was super calm and gentle and we were friends for many years. He provided me with a lot of yarn, and I learned a lot from him, and I made a lot of mistakes with him. But he was really special to me, and this sweater is really special to me as well. It's also super soft and super warm, and I just love it. But my absolute favorite thing I have ever made with Angora fiber are these fingerless mittens. These were made from Charity, my English Angora doe, who was just a pain in the neck, though as she got older she was a bit less feisty. 
You can tell these are my favorite because I've had them for two years and wear them all the time during the winter. So with all the use, they're starting to fray and get old and they're not very appealing to the eye anymore. They're just blobs of fluff where they used to have a really pretty pattern in them. But oh my gosh, they are so soft and so warm. It is like wearing clouds on your hands. And when you're like me and you're a cold-blooded reptile, whose extremities get extremely cold during winter. It is so nice to have little fingerless gloves that you can use as you're reading a book or using your hands so you don't have to constantly keep your hands in your pockets to keep warm. Because all of my Angora fiber comes from actual animals who have a history and a story and they're such small animals and produce such small quantities of yarn at a time, I don't just use the yarn willy-nilly. I try to save it for special important projects because this wonderful product that these wonderful animals have produced has a really special place in my heart and is really, really special and precious to me. Much more so than the cheap acrylic or cotton yarn I usually get at Walmart and use for most of my projects. That is kind of the case for everything you raise yourself, right? If you don't finish your plate of homegrown salad, you don't dump it in the trash, you put it in a Tupperware and save it in the fridge because you know how hard it was to grow those tomatoes and the lettuce and the cucumber. Or you make sure to cook your homegrown chicken in a recipe you know you like because you want to enjoy every morsel of it and fully honor that bird's sacrifice. The more I raise my own food and produce my own necessities, I find myself more and more connected to the things I eat and the products I use. And I'm so grateful for it and so grateful that I can do this because up till recently, everybody was like this. Everybody grew their own food. Everybody made their own clothes and everyone had a lot more respect for everything, but now most things are super cheap and machine made and we are disconnected from the natural process of getting things. I definitely prefer doing things the way God intended. Thanks for watching!